While I'm no film geek, I do appreciate cinema as an art form. Almost more than actually watching the movie sometimes, I enjoy the analysis and the criticism of film done by people a lot, lot smarter than me. I'll watch top 10 lists on YouTube. I'll watch top 10 lists on YouTube or read someone I respect write about a film in glowing terms or see a comment saying, if you love film X, you should watch film Y. The result is that I wind up collecting a whole lot of titles of movies I theoretically like to watch someday. For that reason, I keep track of these films on a platform called Letterboxd. For that reason, I keep track of these films on a platform called Letterboxd. I also use it to track movies I've already seen. While it didn't initially occur to me as Lindsay and I were watching them, I did add in the three BBC productions of Henry VI we'd recently watched for our episodes devoted to those plays. And yesterday, I was going through all the movies I'd ever watched, and for some reason, most likely boredom brought on by procrastination, I sorted them by runtime. The shortest feature-length film on my list was Before Sunset, at 80 minutes in length. The longest was Gone with the Wind, at 233 minutes. But right behind that immortal cinematic masterpiece that helped define an era was Henry VI, Part 3, at 211 minutes. And two slots behind that, Henry VI, Part 2, at 203 minutes. Three slots behind that, Part 1, at 188 minutes. That's over three hours. For all the virtues of these BBC productions of Shakespeare's plays, like high-quality acting, intense devotion to the original text, they are, none of them, Gone with the Wind. It may seem harsh to compare two different mediums, pure film, like Gone with the Wind, and a film adaptation of an original stage play from the 17th century, but many of the deficiencies of Henry VI, especially parts 1 and 3, have nothing to do with how they're shown or staged or any flaw on the part of the BBC. They're just long. Very, very long. And when something is long and feels long, it inevitably lends itself to one word. Boring. And boring is a word often used to describe Shakespeare, and especially his plays. It's not just the complex histories with their myriad characters and obfuscated plots either. Productions of Hamlet can extend to four hours in length, and students can feel every single minute. But it's not just the length of the show either. Macbeth is one of Shakespeare's shortest, most well-respected, and often produced tragedies. Yet in grade 11, as we sat about class, taking turns reading the lines, I distinctly remember the familiar sight of boredom on the eyes of most of my classmates. Most of these classmates might never again willingly engage with Shakespeare on any level, and their only impression of him would be one of boredom. So where does that reputation for being boring come from? And what exactly do we mean by boring? Is this actually a stand-in for other words, like confusing or obscure? And is that reputation for boring well-earned? These are the questions we're looking at today as we examine the bard for boredom in this episode of The Big Stew Shakespeare. Since brevity is the soul of wit, more of your conversation would infect my brain. Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? To speak of him as my kinsman, he's a most notable coward, an infinite and endless liar. An hourly promise breaker, the owner of no one good quality worthy your lordship's entertainment. And beat thee, but I should infect my hand. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. The course of true love never did run smooth. Hey, that was a pretty good essay, Aiden. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah. yeah. You said you said you put something in there that was a point that I made. What point did I make? Uh, you mentioned that Henry the Sixth was long ah, and oh, I was well, like yeah that, okay. that just spurred thought for me because I'm like yeah I saw it on my list earlier that day I was, I was listening like, for like a gem of something it was just no this play is long very long all right well, but that, that's was, that was the genesis of my <laughs> my point so um yeah well I think that's a pretty good rundown of of kind of the main points of and and what we want to get at is that that Shakespeare has this reputation of being boring and why why do we feel that way and is it really justified is it mm. earned um, and I think we both have some some pretty strong feelings about this um, but not only are we uh, digging deep into the shallow recesses of our mm-hmm. combined brain capacity but we've reached out to redditors to ask them what their impressions of Shakespeare as boring um, are and we received a ton of responses. Aiden mm-hmm. was kind of tracking this as we were um, prepping this episode, and uh, 
yeah, we received a ton of comments. I'm, I'm really keen to, I haven't read all of them. So Aiden's going to be kind of hitting the high notes of some of the, the themes and common ideas that people have been saying. But yeah, it's it does seem like it, it does strike a chord. Everybody seems to study Shakespeare. It's one of those canonical um, works of literature, the, co- the collected works. And so it, that, that are taught in everywhere yeah well pretty in, much yeah, everywhere yeah. yeah so i mean everybody has some experience with shakespeare and usually and this is my experience as a teacher who has taught shakespeare kids who have never read a word of shakespeare groan when you say we're studying shakespeare because yeah. there's already this um this idea in their head that it's that it's going to be the worst two yeah, months of their, of their, of their yeah. scholastic <laughs> career yeah and it by the end of it, there are a few kids who always say, oh, that, that was the worst two months that I've ever <laughs> experienced. Yeah. But there are, there are quite a few who have been converted and who think, oh, this isn't that bad. So yeah. um, so it, it did. It made me wonder if people are being turned off before they even get turned on to Shakespeare and, mm-hmm. and what we can do as educators. That's my perspective. But what Aiden and I as as kind of amateur educators i guess whatever yeah, you want sure, to call us call through this, this podcast problem, but yeah. but proselytizers i don't know <laughs> what we can do to try and help people along and and bring people into this world because i think it's fascinating i think the works of shakespeare are interesting and i think it they all hold relevance to varying degrees to our lives today so that's where i'm coming from fair enough sell when you can you are not for all markets so let's let's start with our own thoughts. Mm-hmm. I say Shakespeare and I say Shakespeare is boring. What's your immediate response? I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> that's that's where I'm okay. that's my response. Is yeah. that I get it. I understand it. And I think it's because it is it's long and it's a little bit confusing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an interesting study that came out recently that said that um, reading the works of Shakespeare activates different parts of your brain because a lot of the words are archaic or older forms of, of familiar words or the sentence structure itself is different. Because, mm-hmm. like, remember we've talked about this in our in our previous episodes. Um, we're in the early, early modern English period. The Great Vowel Shift has happened. There's a lot of things that are still kind of in flux with the English language. Um, so, so that sentence structure is is familiar to us but there are things that are different enough that our brains have to work a little bit harder to parse what we're reading and it actually um it excites your brain it it creates a kind of dramatic tension in your brain which is really fitting when you're reading some of the works of Shakespeare but um I think that is something that um if you just if you look at the words on the page as a brand new reader to Shakespeare, you're going to look at that and it's going to look like gobbledygook. It's not going to look like anything you can make sense of. So it does take some effort to get into it. And maybe the effort is what people resist. Maybe it's because it's hard work. Mm -hmm. They say boring, but they really mean this is too much work. The reward for that hard work is having some, some pathways, neural pathways created in your brain that you wouldn't otherwise have created. Um, But a lot of people don't even get to that point. So when you say boring, I'm like, yes, I understand where you're coming from, but let's pick that apart and let's, let's try and make it so that it's not boring. Let's try Mm and, and I come from the perspective that people think it's too hard to read. Mm -hmm. What if I say that to you, Aiden, Shakespeare's boring. I say, yeah, but <laughs> because I again, it's a similar kind of approach. I think uh, I I agree. It 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 is challenging, and that can be a barrier to enjoyment. I mean, mm-hmm. that's whether whatever. Again, mentioning films, I mean, uh, there's simple films that are easy to enjoy, and then there's obscure films that are mm-hmm. harder. And it's just that challenge and that that barrier between you and the engagement with the subject matter. Uh, and I think the biggest one and something that a lot of Redditors jumped in on right away was uh, a lot of us are exposed to it as uh, text. Yes. And it's really, these were meant to be performed. This yeah. was never meant to be just words on a page. It mm-hmm. is always meant to be in the hands of people who 
can understand the language and work with it and show it on on stage. And uh, when you don't get that, I think watching Shakespeare is rarely boring. Yeah. Um, Henry the Sixth, Part Three, perhaps aside, <laughs> uh, but it is. Uh, reading it can be a bit of a chore um, because you do have to parse it. You do have to think and it's it's hard. It's like any really hard book that, that you kind of want to dive into. It can it can be more challenged than you initially feel it's worth. So if boring is on one end and enjoyment, you know, entertainment is on the other end, then I can see why Shakespeare has a, a that can lend itself more to boring. And that's interesting because, correct me if I'm wrong, and you and I both went to school at the same time, different schools, but same years. Mm -hmm. Um, When you were in high school, you you first studied Shakespeare in grade 10, correct? Yep. And same here. So... um, my, I have vivid recollections of my grade 10 English teacher reading Romeo and Juliet to us because that was the standard text. It was either Romeo and Juliet or Merchant of Venice. Yeah. And, um, and stopping after every single line to explain Blaine. what yeah. that line meant. Yeah. And it was the worst experience. <laughs> it was so horrible. Yeah. She, was, she was a lovely lady, this old Welsh woman who just <laughs> loved Shakespeare and she would dress up like when, when I had her in grade 11 too and we did Macbeth and she dressed up like the witches yeah. for the entire time we did Macbeth. It was <laughs> bizarre. But, um, but that stopping after every line is something that me as a teacher now, when I read Romeo and Juliet to and read it with my grade nine students, because we study it in grade nine in some schools here, uh, we would go through it a page at a time or we would read like a whole block of text, like a, a finish a whole speech or we would finish a scene and then we would talk about what it meant because a lot of the problem I think with how we teach Shakespeare is that we are... Um, too focused on on getting the minutiae and getting the, mm-hmm. the the specific meanings of those words in, yeah. but I think what what gets performing lost is it, that yeah. well yeah and and it's what comes across when you're performing it nobody is stopping any performance to say okay did everybody understand what Macbeth was saying yeah. here this is what that word means and yeah, yeah. and here's the footnote like we 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 can't infantilize the students and expect them not to understand it you kind of have to give them that context of a full scene. Or a dialogue, yeah, you know, exactly. when you're Back when you're looking forth. at yeah. Romeo, Mercutio, and Tybalt, and that the whole fight scene in Romeo and Juliet you know, give them the whole scene, read the whole thing and then go back and parse it if you yeah. need to or yeah. whatever. Um, I think that's something that's, at least in my experience, is new in mm-hmm. terms of Shakespeare pedagogy and in terms of um, maybe just in general education. Uh, the older teachers tend to fit into that role and the newer teachers try and make it more exciting is that was that your experience too with Shakespeare when you first studied it vaguely it was I see I my first exposure to Shakespeare was actually in grade nine drama class we uh, watched much ado about nothing and then we we did play like we we showed it we did a scene each of us took turns doing uh i think it was actually a uh, scene for macbeth oh, okay. um with uh i think it's between macbeth and banquo or some i don't remember i don't remember the details but that was more natural because mm-hmm. you had the the playing and watching the film and again i've raved about this film many times but <laughs> maybe it's because it was my first exposure to it but i remember just loving the film because I didn't understand all the words, but I understood the story and I understood the characters because of how they interacted on screen. And that was, that just worked. And then anything where I, where I did miss, uh, key important stuff that the teacher would fill in later. She'd be like, okay, this is what this means. And, and, uh, this, this is what she was getting at when she mentioned this line, like, or whatever, this illusion or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was done after the fact, and I found that was actually much better. So maybe that's why I had a much more positive. Well, yeah, having it in experience. a drama class is mm-hmm. interesting because that's a whole different context than yeah. an English lit class, right? So yeah. definitely, that would make a, a yeah. huge difference. So uh, I'm going to jump into some of the Reddit comments, and they, they are do. they are themed, um, but I do want to read this one because this is the this was the most upvoted uh, comment, and it is it's touching on exactly what we just talked about, but. Um, wouldn't it underscore b letter the letter b underscore lovely uh commented i'm of the opinion that at least in the u.s it's how shakespeare is quote unquote taught in schools in my case the people most directly responsible were mrs and miss my eighth and ninth grade english teachers neither of whom had of even a little understanding of any of the plays assigning classwork and tests from a teacher's guide and requiring students to memorize a certain number of lines to be regurgitated during quizzes mm. All that they actually taught was that Shakespeare was monstrously dull and pointless. 
And though I was able to cure myself as an adult, I don't doubt that most of their victims never went near a play or saw it again and probably spread the contagion to their own offspring. Aww. Which is which is true. I think and this is this is a good summary of the the whole teaching complex. Yeah. Uh inflicting it on kids who either aren't ready uh, or don't want to be engaged or can't be engaged by it because the teacher doesn't really know how to, how to engage them. Mm-hmm. And that's, that is a, a, a curse that I think is repeated across many lands, not just in the U S I mean, it's here in Canada. We like my yeah. story of, uh, the, the dull grayed out eyes of all my <laughs> other students. Uh, and you know, in the UK, I mean, I, I know it's, like they have to write, they have to write something on Shakespeare for most of their college entrance exams right. and stuff, the A levels, right. I think, and stuff like that. So there's there's always a Shakespeare element to this. So it's it's enforced upon everyone in that respect, and without the raw the tools to understand it and how to teach it, I think you you almost do need a solid grounding in Shakespeare, like mm-hmm. you have, Lindsay, mm-hmm. or like a specialized pedagogy course in how to teach drama generally right. to really be able to bring this this out and a lot of teachers just just lack those skills because it's not something you're necessarily gonna have well and i think yeah the other thing that that strikes me about that is is eighth and ninth grade students um memorizing passages soliloquies or speeches um, or sonnets and and just for the purpose of rote learning is not is not fostering any kind of appreciation for language. And that's one of the things that here in Alberta, you know, the program of studies, it's 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 built into it that that there's an appreciation of of literature, an appreciation mm-hmm. of language, an appreciation of this stuff is part of what we do. It's it's only part of it, but it is part of it. Um, and you can't do that if you're just forcing kids to memorize Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo yeah. without understanding what that means. So I mean we're going to get into this, I think, in a separate episode about teaching Shakespeare, where we'll get some of my teacher friends to come on and, and talk a little bit about what we do. But um, I, I just briefly want to say that, you know, teaching Romeo and Juliet, when you're teaching it to a room full of 13 or 14 or 15 year old kids, you know, talking about things that are relatable to them. Romeo and Juliet is one of the most relatable plays for for a, a teenager yeah. it's about teenagers mm-hmm. so you you do things you have to do things you have to do activities you know i show a documentary a, a canadian made documentary um a david suzuki nature of things documentary about the teenage brain and how the teenage brain isn't quite developed yet and how d- that informs our entire reading of the play because we keep coming back to that well you know would juliet make this decision if, if she, she were 29, 25 yeah, exactly. or 26. Yeah. No, because she's 13 and her brain hasn't, her, her frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex hasn't formed yet. Yeah. And the kids have that language and they're able to interact with the play on that level. So it's not sitting there and making them memorize it, which I think comes back to, you mentioned England being, I mean, England, the birthplace of Shakespeare. Um and Shakespeare really birthed England as a, as a <laughs> yeah, thing. So yeah, there's this cultural, weird yeah. symbiotic relationship there. Yeah. Everybody needs to know this. But it's elevated Shakespeare on this pedestal to the point where it's like you need to know what what he says without knowing what he means maybe. Or or it's, it's about um, – we don't explain to people why it's important to understand this, why it's important to, to get this – and and well, you can you can talk about it in, in another way and say why is it important that we are studying Shakespeare yeah. because he's only one guy and yeah. he's four hundred years he's been dead for four hundred <laughs> years and there are a lot of you know Great writers, writers now, women writers yeah, writers of color yeah. you know all various you know backgrounds and and sexual orientations and, and gender expressions yeah exactly why are we only studying Shakespeare and that's a very valid question. But it, it's really shown in stark contrast when you look at how Shakespeare is taught that, that you know, he is one part of a very large puzzle. Maybe some people feel he is a very important part of that puzzle, but he is only one part. And we need to maybe teach it and, and expose people to it in a way that... Um, that honors that it is just a part and honors the student as well as, as the subject matter that's yeah. being presented. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, and you raised uh, another point that the Redditors, a couple of them uh, mentioned, is about the the fact that Shakespeare is so elevated and he yeah. is this this kind of, he's put on a pedestal, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> putting the poet on the pedestal. Uh, <laughs> but he's, I knew you were going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and so along with that comes all this, this, this cultural weight mm-hmm. um, that really 
begs down both the teacher and the the student in a lot yeah. of cases. Um, and I think uh, there was a, a redditor by the name of JJE four one four mentioned that uh, you know if you if you just watch Shakespeare plays for entertainment again, it's pretty easy to go down yeah. and, and do that. But when you're when you're approaching them as as this literary masterpiece, like uh, another user mentioned that uh, when you get to Hamlet and you're like, okay, this is to be or not to be, this is the greatest speech ever written right. in human history about life and death and everything in between. So here you go. Just read it. Great. You know, 18 year old kid whose prefrontal cortex hasn't finished evolving yes. yet, you know, and, and you have to, you have to grapple with this and you have to deal with it. And it's again, totally separate from seeing it performed. Mm-hmm. It's not, uh, it's been rarefied to the to this degree that um, there are you know there are probably PhDs written explicitly about this speech and you as an eighteen year old uh, with very little training are expected to make sense of it and probably write a, a similar essay mm-hmm. you know for your final exam or something like this on the Hamlet speech right. and it's it those two factors kind of combine to just again it's it's extra pressure yeah. to the experience of just. Uh, in interacting with a text on any level like it's like if again going back to film if you were in a film studies class and someone said oh okay well now we're going to do seven samurai it's one of the greatest movies ever made kurosawa is one of his best films uh now we have to you know and you're gonna have to write a paper at the end of this movie it's not the same thing as saying oh let's watch seven samurai it's i've heard it's pretty good and yeah. you put it in and you watch it and you can just enjoy it and uh, appreciate the story and the characters and all the pieces of filmmaking that go into it uh and here we we really don't let our students do that because it's always being tested and i don't think shakespeare <laughs> wrote a play thinking like oh yeah i'm gonna screw over that that 16 year old kid no. one day you know with with my uh king lear <laughs> speech you know yes. so it, it's it's really been separated from uh, the origin and the way Shakespeare wrote it. Uh, and we try and provide that context and so do teachers mm-hmm. and stuff. But at the end of the day, because it is an academic subject now, it's there, there's always going to be a bit of that gulf there. That also brings up a really good point about um, what what do we do when we are interacting with these plays that and with these poets or writers who have been elevated? It feels like you can't criticize them, mm-hmm. right? You can't criticize Kurosawa. You can't criticize Lynch. You can't criticize Shakespeare. Um, yes, I just equated David Lynch and William <laughs> Shakespeare. Would, yeah. Um, well, we should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, yeah. Um, but. But when you present something as this is to be or not to be, it is the greatest speech that has ever been written. Here, let's read this. A kid approaches that as infallible. Mm -hmm. Like that speech cannot be interrogated on any level. (laughs) And I think that is... That is a real problem because we live in a post-modern, post-structuralist or post-post, whatever we're in. (laughs) Whatever we're in now. The death of the author has (laughs) happened. We, We... we come at things with our own shit and our own way of looking at the world. And we we do that with, well, at least in my class, when you look at a, a text, I'm like, do you, one of the first questions I always ask is, do you like it? Mm-hmm. Because that is a valid question. Yep. So if you don't like it, approach it from that point of view. What is it that you don't like? I just want to know. I, I want you to grapple with it. Yeah. We can't expect yeah. people to do that if you're saying this is the greatest thing ever. Because then if you say I don't like it, you have to go up against yeah. 400 years of scholarly yeah. history yeah. and say and, and all these people who are far smarter than you or, you know, have far weightier opinions than you as a 13, 14, 18 year old kid. So the pressure is even more like you have to love it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also part of the problem with this elitist approach to Shakespeare. When you bring it down to the level and and the the Shakespeare, the Globe Theater does a really fantastic job of this. Mm. The groundling experience and getting right down and dirty, talking to the crowd. That is that is as close as possible. They've done such a phenomenal job making that experience as close as possible to the original yeah. anytime you see it performed it's going to be like that but but there's this you know it still feels elitist when you when you approach it from these certain perspectives yeah. right watching shakespeare in a grand old theater yeah. as opposed to watching it in a field yeah. or reading it in a high level english class versus 
I don't know, picking up a, a graphic novel version of yeah, it from yeah. your library, yeah. right? And Which people through, think yeah. is sacrilege. I teach it. I teach Romeo and Juliet from a graphic novel, and people are like, "Well, how can you do that? You're it's an abridged version of Shakespeare." I'm like, "No, it's an enjoyable version of yeah. Shakespeare that 13 year old kids understand. Can manage, yeah. Why is this a problem? Yeah. And it's this elitism that I have that I think personally puts a lot of people off as well. Yeah, and and it is fair to say like that's not. Shakespeare as written, but it doesn't matter. None of it is as written. Very few performances of anything yeah. are, match Shakespeare exactly. I mean, it's, well, yeah, and there are interpretations even yeah, between at every level. Whether like, you're using the quarto version or the folio version, or which of well, the versions you're yeah, gonna, and even like which stage once, directions you're exactly. What, yeah, exactly. What what do you do on stage? What yeah. what do the characters say yeah. uh, in their performance that isn't on the page? Yeah, uh, that all is by definition Our a deviation. Accents. Yeah. We, we've talked about this yeah. with the way that, that we speak the words. They don't match. None of this yeah. is as Shakespeare intended. We are we are interpreting it every single time we read it. So it w- where's the problem here? Yeah. You know, it, a text should never be frozen. Yeah. It should never be frozen in a time capsule and, and never be allowed to grow and breathe. Exactly. Especially Shakespeare. Because yeah. it's just, it, the stories are so good. That's a, that was one of the other comments I read. It was like, well, Shakespeare's, you know, his plays have been, they, they're, it's like The Godfather. You can't watch The Godfather. Like I watched The Godfather. Again, we're doing a lot of movies today. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I watched The Godfather when I was like 25, 26. Yeah. And I was like, eh, it's okay. The reason is because everybody's ripped off the godfather yeah. so like all these like really like the ending is supposed to be like this huge dramatic finale and i'm like well it's kind of like every other <laughs> gangster right. movie that's come out and yeah. every other you know movie that has these interlocking yeah, when plot it's lines the thing that stuff. sets the mold yeah that yeah. you've grown up with then you follow it and it's yeah. not surprising when yes. you look at that mold yeah. so shakespeare has that effect too where yeah. it's it's kind of like uh, oh yeah, I've seen Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> you know because yeah, I've because seen you've anything. seen West Side Story. Yeah, or yeah. you've seen Romeo and Juliet, or yeah. whatever. <laughs> or whatever I've seen The Lion be. King, and therefore, do I really need to watch yeah, Hamlet? You know, exactly. like there's these things, right? So, but that speaks to the universality of Shakespeare, which a lot of people gloss over when you tell kids, well, actually, Hamlet is the same story as Lion King. They're like, no, it's not. Yeah. What are you talking about? But when you get down to the basics, it's it is essentially the same story of tragedy, betrayal, and and all this stuff that that goes on vengeance how you deal with that those are universal truths universal yeah. ideals so um when you when you block off yourself block yourself off from shakespeare you're blocking yourself off from from a, a grand literary tradition that continues up to this day you're like cutting off a whole part of that right which is yeah you know kind of sad although uh, i will point out that famous short story or was it an essay i don't remember uh about the guy who was uh traveling in the bush uh in africa or something in like the turn of the century 1900s yeah uh and he uh heart of darkness no 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 no. it was no i don't know if you read this i read it in english 101 and it was basically a a critique of shakespeare because he's trying to explain hamlet the greatest story ever told and there's so much cultural oh yeah uh, no nuance to the story of hamlet like well yeah of course when his father died the wife married the brother that's how things are done right so it's it's you know there's there are there is a universality to the stories, yes. uh, and but it's interesting how they always get adapted, and that's something what we're going to come back in another episode to yeah. uh, international adaptations of Shakespeare because yeah. there's some amazing ones out there that will yeah. that will definitely yeah. Thank be you for about. pointing that. That is a good. It's it's universal from a Western um, yeah literary tradition kind point, of point of view, view, which is which is very self limiting. So, yeah. but yeah. it's the one we still operate yeah. under for the most part. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Uh, another key uh kind of similarity amongst the comments was uh the the limitations that the language put on the reader um and especially readers again we we mentioned this in our kind of overview too um it is a challenge to read Mm -hmm. uh the words are out of order and compared to what we're used to there are archaic words uh there's archaic words that even when the the footnote explains it doesn't really make much sense sometimes uh and that that can be a real challenge so Mm -hmm. that that's another reason why uh kind of getting to to the point i was making is that um when you have to dissect the language it it puts up the barrier to enjoying Mm it uh and that can lead it to kind of uh, becoming boring uh, and uh, another commenter uh, agreed with you uh, Philia Day uh, said too many teachers take the approach of hacking and dissecting the language to death in order to enable students understanding but in my experience this generally leads to boredom and mm-hmm. apathy so mm-hmm. that is I think that is a common experience too yeah. of like 
Uh, and I do remember that from grade 10 Shakespeare. Again, I've mentioned this, the uh, uh, twice blessed droppeth reigneth uh, speech from Merchant of Venice right. from uh, Portia and the mercy speech, sorry. Um, and like, I remember our, my teacher just going through that line by yeah. line by line. And I was like, okay, but I kind of got that already by right. just reading the whole thing and, and taking it in. But mm-hmm. I remember going through it slowly and I was like, oh, this is just a waste of time. Mm-hmm. So I was bored. Mm-hmm. And that was that was really just the fall of the teacher at the time. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's it's something that comes up and I think it's a fair point. Um, another commenter, uh, Anna Wiki, uh, pointed out that uh, there's a great... The, the the cure to that is often reading it out loud because yep. we often read it silently when yep. we're reading the text on our own. Uh, reading out loud cures a lot of that because it forces you to say the words and mm-hmm. mouth them out and mm-hmm. you can feel that rhythm and rhyme that's, that's in a lot of it. This is something else that as a teacher I use a lot, especially with kids who have any kind of learning disability or, or just a learning preference, to have the text read to them. Um, when I send the text home with them, I'll find some audiobook version of the of the text for them not necessarily with Shakespeare but with other texts because that does tend to trigger different parts of your brain Um, some people do need that right so whether you're reading it aloud or whether somebody is reading it to you um, definitely it makes a difference and I think with Shakespeare if you can't see it performed and I I don't remember seeing Shakespeare performed much before I was about 18 or 19 Mm -hmm. we never got to see the plays performed we might have watched a film version version but it wasn't the stage version so yeah. and I still think that is the best way to experience Shakespeare as, as wonderful as some of these adaptations are and I will go to the mattresses for <laughs> Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet I think that it is one of the greatest adaptations of Shakespeare that I've ever seen and we'll get there we will get we there, will get and there we will have that fight. we will have that that will be our, our <laughs> that will be our big yes but um but the stage versions I think are are always better and and if you don't have access to that And not everybody is going to want to sit through a BBC version or even just listening to the BBC version or whatever. But but if you don't have access to that, an audio version of it or reading it aloud is definitely Mm -hmm. going to um, it's definitely going to be beneficial, I think, to to get that flow of the language, especially when you say it out loud. There's just something about saying Shakespearean words that, you know, one of the first things that kids say when when after they grown, when they. They, that they've started that Shakespeare. They, started yeah. Shakespeare. <laughs> they start pulling out the wherefores and thithers and they, they just start. They like it. Because they like it because it's a weird kind of, we don't say that anymore. Yeah. So it's it's interesting to them. And they yeah. really do enjoy learning about the great vowel shift. I mean, yeah. partly because I really enjoyed it and <laughs> they really thought it was talking. funny that the teacher was so excited about shit, well, you know? But it's interesting because these kids are in the midst of another language revolution of internet speak Absolutely. and stuff like that. There's so much going on in the English language. And these kids don't even realize that they're they're a part of that. Yeah. Like every time they say yeet and throw a can down the hallway, right. that's part of what's changing in the English language. And uh, so, I mean, it's kind of interesting that they – and they do. Uh, kids adopt slang mm-hmm. and new words all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. And so when they start saying ye- yeeteth, yes. <laughs> the, the Lord yeeteth and the Lord yoinketh away, like when they start, you know, applying Shakespeare terms to their, to their life, it's kind of – it's reinvigorating yeah. this this language and it is it is a growing part of but it of reinforces it. also what they're doing naturally when you say Shakespeare did this this is this is somebody that we've elevated to the point of of deifying him and he did this shit he invented these words and this is what you're doing you're inventing words today in class you are part of a grand literary tradition here be proud. Don't let anybody tell you that yeet is not a word. It has <laughs> it has grammatical placement. This this podcast is going to be so out of date in six <laughs> yeah, months. I know. Yeah. I don't even think people say yeet anymore, honestly. <laughs> but <laughs> but no, I mean, or or the way that that kids adopt meme text and yeah. and meme uh, or like. Uh, quotes from vines yeah. and and incorporate that into their daily i had somebody the other day at school we were saying put them five feet apart and somebody goes because they're not okay. gay <laughs> and it was just like okay we're going there yeah. right like <laughs> so i mean but this is what language does and when you tell people that shakespeare is not is not immutable shakespeare yeah. was was in flux shakespeare was doing this in that's what I mean when I say that you can't isolate this and, and freeze it in time. It is part of a moving, yeah. it's a gear in the language and it's part of a moving structure that we live in to this day. Yeah. 
and you embody that every time you yeeteth or yoinketh. Yes, as required. As required, yes. Uh, and sorry, I, I brought up the whole language shift now, but throwing off, us off course a little bit because uh, you did mention another big theme in the, the Reddit comments mm. was uh, seeing it performed. Right. Uh, and in particular, seeing it performed in person. Uh, yeah. As you mentioned, uh, there was uh, one commenter, ENGR prof 42. I hope that's English prof uh, <laughs> because that would just be awesome. But, uh, you know, uh, saying that I found it boring for a long time because I was forced to read it without any drama training or, or uh, visuals. The vocabulary and lack of description makes it hard to get going. And I, this person likes to read. Um, but then they saw the movies and started to fall in love with them. And then when they could go to live performances, that when it really, that's when it really clicked. Yeah. And there's there were a bunch of that saying like, well, yeah, uh, Shakespeare's awesome. How can you not love it? If you, right. As soon as you've seen a live version, yeah. you're sold, right? Yeah. Um, but that's the other thing is there's barriers to that as well. Yes. So um, you have to be in kind of a culturally... Diverse. Yeah, area. culturally rich area yeah. in order to have access to those performances mm-hmm. even. Um, especially as as a student, like if, if there's not a, a local production of a Shakespeare play going on and while you're teaching the play, then mm. you're never going to get it, right? Yeah. And so, or at least not matching up with what the teacher's telling you and trying yeah. to connect all those pieces, right? Um, and that's another experience I had was going to see Romeo and Juliet. I was in grade 12 and I didn't, I never studied Romeo and Juliet, but I saw it at our local theater. Uh, I know you also went that year. We've talked about this in the past. Wait, did I? Yes, you did. We talked about this. Did we? Yes. And Where the guy was, was naked and he rolled out of the stage and all the girls were like, mm, when he rolled out of bed after the... Was it grade 11 or grade 12? Where was it performed? At the Windspear. Not the Windspear. The Citadel? Citadel. I do not recall this at all. I would We've remember. We've talked about this. I think you're talking about your other girlfriend. I don't have any other girlfriends. Okay. Well, I'll take your word for it, but I don't remember seeing this. <laughs> okay. Well, I do. Okay. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, yeah, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. And even most of the kids who were bored in my grade 11 class what, reading Macbeth uh, enjoyed it, if only because they saw a dong that day. <laughs> uh, but I mean, oh and, th- and that is that is part of it though, is to the, having the ability to see that really makes Shakespeare come alive. Yeah. Um, and once once you've seen it that way, it's it's easier to get into a text version or something like that. That whole barrier to access is um, is an important one too because with that elite status that Shakespeare has, there tends to be a higher price point for anything that involves Shakespeare. So um, we've seen our local Shakespeare festival. Um, the last 16 years they do two plays every year and we've seen both plays and I remember our first year going was the summer of 2004 I think and it was like $20 a ticket yeah. maybe maybe $40 for the for the festival pass or yeah. something like that for both of us I think yeah we it was, it was really was cheap. really cheap yeah. and now it's quite pricey yeah. which I understand there's there are costs involved with running a big festival it's it's a month long festival and they run it almost every day and there's there is a lot of overhead there but um and even though they do fun nights like a pay what you will night where and they have student rates and they have seniors rates and matinees that are cheaper and stuff like that like there are ways to get into it but it is still quite cost prohibitive and in, unless you are you know have a lot of disposable income or are part of one of those groups that can benefit from a discount there, there really isn't an easy way to interact with that um, if money is tight. Mm-hmm. And we've been lucky enough. Like we went to London, we saw it in in, yep. Sh- in uh, the Globe. Yeah, um, we also saw it. We also saw it in Germany when we were in Bremen. Yep. We went to a performance of Midsummer Night's Dream in German, and that was, I think, also put on by a, a university. So it was quite cheap. It was like yep. five or ten euros for us to get in to see this performance. Yep. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that doesn't seem to happen a lot unless you really are plugged in and know where to look. And so and if you live in a small town or you live, you know, in, in an area where this kind of stuff just doesn't happen or or you're physically limited in some way, you don't have a car, or mm-hmm. you're, you know, disabled or something yep. that There's can be. Barriers, yeah. yeah, just extra barriers to, to doing that, which is where things like the BBC productions do come in handy because at least you will get to see it. But there really isn't anything like seeing it live. And yeah. that can if you aren't able to do that, that might also be something that limits your ability to enjoy it. And that's a shame. There's just no no way around that. It's true. And it's it's something that I think gets 
glossed over it, but it also mm-hmm. ties into that whole literary canon thing yeah. is that uh, y- you should have to pay to see Shakespeare well, that's, because that's, of yeah. course it's Shakespeare. Yeah, and, exactly. But it's kind of like, no, nah, you can also just do Shakespeare literally like a two man Shakespeare play. Like we saw a fringe production. We've mentioned this, I think in the past of it was Macbeth. It was just uh, hand shadow puppets. puppets, hand puppets and yeah. like really cheap. There was no dialogue. There was no. literally no talking. Yeah, it, it was, was Shakespeare silent. without. So, yeah. Silent was, Shakespeare. Brilliant. It was, it was one of the was, coolest was, adaptations I've ever yeah, seen. How do you do so Shakespeare great. without doing the language? It just reduces it to its emotional core. Yeah. It was fantastic. And it was, it was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. And it was twelve bucks because it was a fringe show. Like yeah. it was, yeah. So th- there are there are ways around that, but generally, uh, most of us are limited by what yeah. by the the options we have. Nothing will come of nothing. Another interesting comment, uh, and this is something we'll have to we'll have to look into. Um, but uh, user Babzarella WT uh, said that there's an Al Pacino documentary called. Doc- documentary wow a documentary uh called looking for richard that explores this this oh, entire yes. concept so uh in part like kevin klein is interviewed and stuff yeah. the, the, it sounds like a really interesting movie i think well we might have to do a, a separate episode mm-hmm. on that or come back to this topic with the with the movie in mind but just wanted to mention that one um and the other uh one that kind of came up uh a fair bit is that um it was around uh you know again the the parental and students uh, kind of wait again that cultural weight mm-hmm. of uh, students don't want to engage with this text because it is harder than what they're used to and they've already you know most kids don't really like school that much right. anyway so it's just another thing and also the the parental kind of uh, weight uh, and the the parental weight yeah well not weight weight is a terrible word it's not at all close to what I'm going for uh, the parental uh, passing on of of their oh, own conceptions okay. of Shakespeare it's like so oh, your, you're your dad hated it yeah they groan about it at the dinner table yeah it's like oh you're reading Shakespeare oh, oh, tough yeah, luck but yeah, yeah kind yeah, of stuff okay. right and it's it's that's kind of imbued into a lot of it and that I mean there's another comment saying like Americans are especially are kind of anti-intellectual in a yes. lot of cases so uh, there could be that too that it's not just parents it's mm-hmm. it's a larger societal thing mm-hmm. saying like oh shakespeare's for east coast liberal elites you know right. that's and it you know doesn't need to be at all right. um so there, there's all those pieces as well um that kind of tie in and i think we've touched on on how that works yeah and the last comment i think i wanted to go give detail to uh was uh given by drubbing tub which is a great name uh, who said, I feel compelled to say that in many sh- instances, Shakespeare is boring. <laughs> she, um, some Shakespeare performances feel like community service. That's not to say it isn't still great. People find loads of great things boring. <laughs> I love watching different productions of the same play because you can see the various renditions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I mean, I think that is a fair course or a fair complaint that, you know, sometimes there's bad productions of Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. We're talking about, oh, yeah, you see it in person and it'll just be, it'll change your mind about it entirely. Yeah. But it really does need to be a competent production and yes. people need to understand. And I mean, even, uh, I don't know if your school, high school drama team did a Shakespeare production no. as part of it. No? Okay. No, never. But um, universities often will, you know, there's yeah. those are the cheaper versions that you yeah. might be able to go see. And maybe those ones are limited by you know students actors who right. you know can't grasp the language as well or who don't have time because or a, a teacher who doesn't quite understand it because i think that is a, a huge barrier as you mentioned mm-hmm. Dean, that um that if a teacher or your director, your director even, yeah, doesn't, doesn't have the grasp then that can lead to problems with interpretation and problems with um the staging and that kind of thing so but it also gets back to our my point at the very start of this episode which is that some man three hour no i mean the Henry the Sixth Part Three is three hundred minutes long. That yeah. is, that is long. Three hundred minutes? No, did I say three hundred? Yeah, it was two hundred thirty or yeah. something. Sorry, that's still almost like what is that? Almost four hours? Like, it's long. Yeah, that that was a long, long play. There was an intermission. And we barely made it back. No, I think I think I think we took like a couple hours break, and then we're like, "Oh, I need to reset, yeah, yeah. man. I need a nap. I need a carb load here. This is this is intense. Five hour energy. We're gonna power through yes. the little second half. So yeah, there is that point too. But that what what's funny to me about all of this is that um, by all accounts, Shakespearean language was spoken faster. Mm-hmm. A play like Romeo and Juliet literally in the prologue says the two hours passage of our stage 
that whole play would have been performed in, in two, two hours. hours. Now you're lucky if you get a Romeo and Juliet that is less than three hours, mm-hmm. right? And it's Romeo and Juliet. It's not a long play yeah. by any stretch of the. It's no, not, not compared it's to not others. Yeah, one of the Henrys or, or Hamlets. Yeah, right. So, um, so are we dragging this out unnecessarily? Um, and, and for what purpose is, is that, yeah, and, are we, I, and yeah. it, it's possible we are just speaking slower and, and there's a, a desire to do that so that people understand it, but, um, or even just the approach of acting has changed. Yeah. Like it might've just been back then. You just, you spit out the lines really yeah. quick and, yeah. and that's just the style at the time, yeah. like the onion on the belt. Right, uh, but, <laughs> but, or maybe, yeah, or there's, but is it us who's changed it or is yeah. it, uh, we, again, we're adapting it to fit our tastes mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and proclivities. And that's what I, you know, I think coming back to this, this idea that maybe Shakespeare is boring and maybe that's okay. Maybe that, maybe it's, it's not that it's boring. It's, it's something else that we're using the word boring as like a, a, a stopgap mm. word, but it actually means something else. And that there's validity to that. I think that that is, um, that's entirely fair to say that a, a three hour long performance is a bridge too far and I can't do it. No. Um, or, a, a 40 page or, you know, double line, very tiny eight point font is too much to read. No. You know, that that's, that's valid. And I don't think it makes you a bad person if you feel that Shakespeare is just boring, even if you don't mean that it's boring, if you mean something else. I think that that is something that we can't we can't force people to love it. We can't force people to engage with it. Um, but maybe we can change the way we approach it mm-hmm. and and make it so that it's not a scary thing if you without dumbing it down because you don't want to do that that's insulting to your audience but you can do it in a way that that engages people in in, and I think that's the way me as an educator that's the way that the the educational world is going Mm -hmm. um and maybe it's something that that drama productions will continue to do or or are already starting to do Mm -hmm. if music be the food of love play on all right, so this week's marriage counseling, um, a little bit different. It's it's less of a debate and more of just us presenting our opinion, our 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 um, what do you call them, position papers. Yeah, we're we're, we're, we're taking a stand, taking here, a, stand. a stand, and we're gonna see, we're gonna argue over who does the better stand. I guess. I guess so. Um, we are talking about what is the most boring Shakespeare production <laughs> that you have ever seen. Lindsay, do you want to go first? I, I'm scared that you and I have chosen the same well, play. Well, if you have, then I will think of my second really quick while you're talking. So. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so think on your feet because, yeah. Um, I, as much as I enjoyed the experience of this, I think the German production of Midsummer Night's Dream was the most boring production I ever saw. And okay. I, I will say it's because I didn't understand <laughs> the language. Um, Fair enough. I understood what was going on, and I think that is a testament to the production, to the team that put it on. And your Midsummer memory Night's of Midsummer Dream, Night's Dream is, yeah. is an easy play to kind of figure out. Um, but it was... I, I remember very vividly sitting in this auditorium and thinking, oh, we still have to do this. This scene still has to happen. And I've never experienced that before in any production. I'm like, yeah. I'm laughing and I'm having fun. And, and, and it was fun. It was neat to see how, and, and the little German that we know, you could, you could pick up, you know, a few of the things where it might be a little bit different or where they had to do some interpretive, you yeah, know, magic shifting, yeah. to, to make it fit. But um, but I did rem- I do vividly remember thinking, oh, we still have to do this scene. Oh, oh, and then there's still that, and oh, we're gonna be here for another hour, aren't we? <laughs> oh yeah, let's clap. Yes, that was a great scene. Ha ha ha. That was so funny. It was just a very disheartening, <laughs> kind of depressing experience. Oh, all right. I loved it. I loved being there with you, Aiden. It yeah. was it was one of those things where like, what are we gonna do tonight in Bremen? Oh, there's a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah, let's do let's it. Let's do that. And then we got there, and I'm like, shit, we have to we, we have, have to, to do this. To this. We're <laughs> we're in. This is this is happening. This is happening. Uh, so okay. that's that's what I'm gonna say is is the most boring production. Okay. Aiden, what's yours? Uh, mine has more to do with the actual text. Ah, it was when okay. we watched Titus Andronicus. Oh, okay. Uh, at our local Shakespeare production company. Yeah. Uh, and it was, I, 
the thing, I don't even remember that. Well, that's my point is <laughs> okay. that I, cause I remember, uh, it was, I think it was one of the ones where we got rained out or, or there was a storm coming or they had to cancel the production earlier. The microphones all died or I don't know, something bad happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember thinking like, I'm so glad that this <laughs> play ended early. Right. Um, and I just remember thinking like, it's so bloody and violent and I didn't care about any of the characters. I wanted them all to yeah, die yeah. and they were slowly doing it and yeah. that was still not making me happy. Yeah. And uh so that was <laughs> and honestly that's my only memory of that entire performance. Interesting. Uh and so I I feel like if that's the only thing that's left behind and I I scanned through my memory for other other performances by this company or other ones we've seen or even film adaptations 10 things i hate about you was not great but it was still enjoyable and i could watch it uh this one i was just happy when it was over so uh and i I remember being bored so Mm -hmm. and it's weird because it is a very violent action-packed kind of well but maybe that's that's a testament to the fact that violence doesn't always keep bums in seats maybe it did in the 16th 17th century but uh us 21st century folk you know maybe not maybe that was one of the questions i didn't mention this when we were talking about uh reddit but it was one of my things i put out there is it is part of the reason shakespeare is considered boring because there's not a lot of action Mm. sequences and stuff but uh a lot of the redditors pointed out well there are you know you can film macbeth and with big battle scenes and henry v obviously it has been done exactly so it's not necessarily the fact we we just did the first and third parts of henry the sixth have tons of battle scenes and those are boring so ass place yeah. so it's not it's not about the action i think i think we've we've pretty much done this to death already at this yeah. point this early in the podcast that that shakespeare is at its best when shakespeare is at his best when action it's, is not the focus when action yeah. is not the focus yeah. because that's hard to do on on a stage so yeah. no that's um, true yeah but yeah so there it is I That's guess there's no funny. real there's no real victor no, in this week. No, but, but I, I do think the fact that neither one of us really remember Titus Andronicus <laughs> kind crap. of kind of puts uh, puts that that win in your column. Yeah. Okay, I'll take that. You'll I'll take, take that. that I'll win. take that You'll by take default. That yeah. W. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. So that's that's our episode today. Yep. Um, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll throw up the links to that uh, the study that was done about the Shakespeare's effect on the brain. Yep. We'll also put the link to our Reddit. Um, the thread. Reddit conversation yeah. and threads that were happening there if you want to read through all the comments yeah. there are a lot of really great comments yeah, and, yeah. and put some, in a lot of good thought and yeah stuff. if you want to add really your own praised, or, yeah. or yeah. Uh, keep that conversation going that would be fantastic and we'll also link to uh, the IMDB page or an, an entry for that uh, uh, Al Pacino documentary yes. that we, we will have to watch maybe that Aiden you should also put your letterboxed link because I yeah, think that is the most go. Aiden thing to do yes, is that you we were that. bored one day and you ranked them by <laughs> runtime. I think that's just this is why I love you this is why this is why I married you because you do shit like that <laughs> that is weird and I love you back for it <laughs> You can find all our episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast fix. If you want to tell us what you think of Shakespeare, his plays, poems, or any of the topics we discuss, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us on Twitter, that's at the Bixpod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Bixpod, or by email at thebixpod at gmail.com. That's our cue to exit.